hey there welcome to this episode and as you can see we are diving in with the mpc1 here now this is a beginner's guide to the mpc workflow and i just want to touch on a few sort of fundamental key things here that will help you out if you're struggling with these devices now if you're a seasoned user this isn't going to be particularly useful for you however it's geared for new users who like myself only a couple of months ago i was kind of struggling getting the workflow of this thing down understanding this section here couple of things like sample edit to program edit. So I want to make a little bit of a random beat sketch. It's not going to be anything great, but it will demonstrate just, you know, how to use this device. Now it's going to be live and unedited, and I will put some time codes in. You can skip to the bit that you're most interested in. So we have the MPC-1 here, but this applies to the MPC-1, the OnePlus, the Live, the Live 2, and, you know, the X as well. Anything that uses this internal sort of software that is on these like hardware devices it's only the device itself that will change in terms of the layout and where your buttons are um, but you'll be able to get something from this uh, if you're a beginner user for any mpc the mpc workflow is steep i think when you first get involved with one of these devices it's not particularly intuitive and that's not to knock it i think just what it does though is very complex there are lots of ways to do exactly the same thing and that can lead to it just feeling quite complicated. There's a whole bunch of menus. Every time you press another screen, you end up with another menu. It can be just overwhelming. And so I just want to break down that process a little bit here, make something, and we can kind of go from there. So let's start with our sequences here. If you, you know, I'm making a few assumptions that you've downloaded your all your sample packs and you've got access to samples. Your firmware is all up to date. I'm not getting that far into a deep dive. I might do that in another series at some point. But today I want to look at, yeah, this kind of main screen as you open it up. So no demo screen, just a blank template. You're greeted with these three sections and understanding these three sections will be the key to making your life a lot easier with this device. At the top here, we have our sequences. So sequences you can think of as building block chunks for a song. It could just be like a clip in Ableton where you just want to get an idea down and then expand on it later. It could be an intro, then you can make another sequence, which is a verse and so forth. Or it can just be one giant long sequence that you can build your entire track in because this bar length goes up. I can't remember what the maximum is, but it's way over 100 bars. So you can just make one long sequence and go from there. Now today, we want to start off with a goal, and I think whenever you're setting out, that's kind of a little thing to just tell yourself. Obviously, you know what you want to do, but in this case, I want to make a loop, because in a loop, I can put some drums and some chops. I can do a seed or like a sketch of a beat, which is what I call them, as like an idea, and then I want to develop that later on. If it's something I like, I can make other sequences and form it from there. So we are going to do that, and the first tip I'm going to give you is to label everything. And you'll see here we have these little A icons. If we click on those, we can name things. So our first sequence essentially is going to be a loop. And I'm just going to call it loop one in case we expand on that later. In terms of our bars here, we can make it whatever length we want. So I want two bars. That seems like a standard place to go. And the BPM, let's set this to say something like, I don't know, 80. Doesn't matter. It can be anything you like. One thing to bear in mind with sequences is that you obviously you can make multiple sequences. So we could make an intro, a verse, you know, a verse, a chorus, and then chain those together later on and have the uh, device play that for us in the order that we choose. But each of those individual sequences can have its own BPM. Now, it's not going to be particularly important for this um, demonstration, but it is a good thing to know. So if you want to make one loop, which could be essentially like a beat or a sketch, you can have that at 60 BPM and then the next one you make could be 170 and you can just, you know, almost build like a DJ set inside of like one project. So keep that in mind. There is independence there. Now that we know our intention, we're intending to make a loop. I want to have some tracks inside of that loop. And again, with the MPC, it's super flexible. It allows you to work in lots of different ways. I know some people who will just build everything in one drum program, put some loops in here, a whole song if you like, uh, some one shots, and then just do like a performance thing and build it from there. You can do that too on this device, but we're going to be talking today about building individual tracks similar to a DAW, Ableton, whatever it is. We're going to kind of work in that way. 
Now, a track could be anything broken down to uh, just a track just for your kick drum, one for your snare and so forth. But I'm going to group those up a little bit to make life easier. So today when I'm working, and this is kind of how I always work, I'm going to have those, all of my drum sounds in one track. So my first track that I want to create is drums. So I'm going to call it that. And we'll do this. And so we've now named that drums. So we have a sequence, 80 BPM with two bars. And we're going to start making some drums here on a drum track. Now, for every track that we create in this particular workflow, I'm going to add a program of some kind to supply the sounds for that track. So if you were in Logic, Ableton or whatever, sometimes you have like a, a drum rack or something that you're going to put all your sounds into and play it. It's going to use that MIDI information and you can go from there. So for every track, I have an associated drum track or you know, as an associated program even. The first thing that we get here is a drum program. So an empty drum program called program 001. It's just like a basic default. That's what I'm going to use because I'm going to bring in some samples, some drum samples. I'm going to play those. But a couple of things here. One, a drum program doesn't mean it's just for drums. It means it can be for any sample. So it could be a full song. It could be loops. It could be one shots. Anything that I want to put in here, I could do. That's completely up to me. That's, you know, up to you when you're working. But for now, we're going to use a drum program and we're going to put drum sounds in there. And because I know that, I'm going to label this and just rename this one, this default one, as drum. Uh, and then we'll just call this samples. Like that. So I'm labeling everything clearly. And the reason for that, aside from just being organized with your projects, is because this device has what feels like hundreds of different menus, whether you're browsing, you're in the track mix, whatever it is. And when you can see drum samples here or drums or loop one, because we know what that is, then we know where we're at whenever we're, you know, navigating through this device. The MPC gives you a lot of ways to do exactly the same thing. And I'm not going to dive into all of those. I just want to give you an example of that. So you know what I'm talking about, where we have our buttons here. It's one way to navigate the device. We have white writing across the top. That's one menu and the black writing underneath is another menu type. So in order to access, say, the sampler, which is written above, I press this button and there's the sampler. I want the looper. I do shift and there's the looper underneath it. However, if I was in the main page again and I wanted the sampler, I can click it. I can also just double click and get to the looper. And then we have the touch screen, of course. So if you like using the touch screen more and you don't want to use these so much, we can go home here and I can see my sampler or I can see my browser, the looper, anything that we need to access. We can do it via the screen. And there seems to be a lot of things that the MPC does that are kind of like that. Then the same way to do exactly the same thing. It's great for creating an independent workflow that suits you. But as a new user, it's also quite daunting because Sometimes you just stumble upon a menu and you're not really sure how you got there because you might have got to it one way before and then you suddenly get to it another way. It just can be a little bit confusing. Anyway, we won't worry about that for now. We're going to go back to our main page. So our sequence, our first track and our first program. Now in the bottom where we have the programs here, another thing that I think is a little bit confusing with the design of this is that the program types that you choose for your tracks are actually listed here on the track lane. And I think if they were listed here underneath where the drum programs are or the programs, it would be a little bit more um, intuitive, but they're not there here. So we are making a drum program, which is this four little squares. We could also make a plugin uh, program. So that would use one of the internal plugins. So like the VSTs for um, Ableton, Logic, whatever. You might have an instrument. Akai will provide you with some. You can buy some more. I don't use them that often, but they're there. The next one along here, and you'll notice the reason I was avoiding touching them, which I just accidentally did there, is because it creates that for me. And I don't particularly need another MIDI program just now. So I'm actually going to use the delete and delete that program and just go back here. So the next one, the little plug icon, as we said, is the plugins. The next one, the little keyboard icon there is a key group program so we can load in one sample. It spreads it across the pads and you can play like chromatically. 
It works the best if you have a C note tuned sample because then it's going to play properly and you can take advantage of the chords and notes function on this device, which will just let you do easy one finger chords and all kinds of stuff. So pretty handy. Underneath, we have the little square icon there with the little arrow, and that is a clip program. That is for audio loops. So if I want to bring an audio loop into my project, I could bring a loop in of any kind uh, at any BPM. So our BPM is currently at 80. I could bring one in at 110 BPM. It's going to play synced in time and time stretch to match the global tempo or the, you know, the sequence tempo. So it's a pretty handy thing to be able to use these clips, these audio clips and loops, if you like doing that. The next one is MIDI. Now, all of these program types here are MIDI program types. They use MIDI information and we'll dive further into that later on. But there is a separate MIDI because you might want to use external MIDI equipment and sequence in from your MIDI hardware or whatever it is. I don't do a lot of that. I'm not going to cover it in this. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, unfortunately, this isn't going to be the video. But that's what I use it for. Or, you know, you would use it for is to bring in external MIDI. And then we have a CV program, which, again, I'm not familiar with, but I believe it's for modular gear and anything that uses CV gates. So you can assign something like that. So whenever you're creating your track, that's what you're going to be thinking of. What is going to be the most appropriate program to use for my individual tracks? In this case, a drum track with a drum program is going to work best because we're just going to load samples in. So that's the next thing we're going to do. We're going to go to browse. Again, I could access it here through the screen. However, you want to do that it takes you to the same browsing menu. I can use my data wheel here to scroll through, or I can use my finger, double click to open, press open to open or press this button to open multiple ways to do the same thing. I'm going to scroll through. I want to go back up a level, so I'm going to go up here. And what I'm currently looking at is my SD cards. So if I go to places, you'll see MPC SD card, which is loaded up, is what I'm looking at. You want all the factory content and the MPC expansions and all of that. You can find those. And if we open up, say, a drums folder here and go through to 90s drums, closed hats, I can see everything because I've got my files selected here. But say I was looking for a plugin, I could choose plugins. You'll see nothing because there's no plugins in there. But if I'm looking for a WAV file, all of my WAV files are there. So we have types to search for. We can search by, um, you know, the search directory. So we could type in bass. Anything labeled with bass is going to show up. Perhaps you're looking for a specific sample that you know the name of. You can do that that way. And you can set some favorites as well. So it's all pretty handy stuff. We're going to come back up to a top level here where we got some drums. And uh, should we I'm going to use some Beat Butcher stuff. I always do, but it's just always at the top of my list. And that's another thing to speak of. If you're looking through and you've got a, you know, a folder full of other folders or full of files, you're looking for something alphabetically and you know you're looking for something way down at the bottom. So by, you know, Z, for example, I can use this arrow icon to change the uh, order there. So S is the furthest down. And if I change it again, B, if I had something that was labeled A, of course, it'd be right at the beginning of the alphabet. I can do that there. So keep that in mind because it's handy when you've got lots of files and folders to go through. I'm just looking for a kick drum. So let's open up a kick drum folder and I'm going to be using the data wheel mostly. But of course, I could use the screen. And the next thing here is audition by default. This is usually set to off, I believe. So you have to choose your sample and then press this. So that we can listen. I think that's awkward. So turn auto on. And as you scroll through, you can hear your samples and then just load them up. I think it's much easier. So let's just find a kick drum that we like the sound of. Let's say spicy kick was the one that I wanted. You'll notice currently I haven't touched any pads so nothing is lit up. But I want to do that on purpose. And that is to load a sample like this. And you will notice that it seemed to load something, but it disappeared because we haven't assigned it to anything. And where it's gone is into the sample pool. So if we look here, browse and then sample assign, I can click this and you will see we have this sample pool. So whenever you create a new project, you create a sample pool that all of the project, all of the samples even go into for that project. Whether you've assigned them to a pad or not, they're going to end up in here. 
if you record something from the sampler, for example, or you're resampling, you're doing something, and you click keep it, and you haven't assigned it to a pad or a program somewhere where it's going to go, it will end up in the sample pool if you're looking for it. It's useful to know that that's here because it's not very clear, again, as like a new user, where that's going to be, but it's in here. The other reason is that when you make a project like this, let's say you're keen on bringing in lots of samples and trying different stuff, but you don't end up using half of them, they'll still be in the sample pool. And if you want to export that project or you're just trying to save space, you might want to delete all of the unused samples or the unassigned samples. And you can delete them by long press here and delete sample. Or I can use this little uh, chip icon here, which opens up a purge menu and I can sell it to purge all unused samples. So keep that in mind. There is a little sample pool here, kind of tucked away, uh, but it's where all your samples will be. We can assign from the sample pool as well. So you can see this moving on the screen. I can do the same on the pads, whatever you prefer. I like the pads. I can double click. And that is now assigned to this pad. So we can start building our kit. We can go back to browse and we can come up a level and find some uh, hi hat samples or something. That one sounds quite nice. So this time, rather than just loading it into the sample pool, I'm going to load it directly to a pad. Again, I could double click, I could load, or I could just click the button. I'm going to choose my pad first, load it in. And I know another one here, let's maybe take that one, load that one in. And then we'll go up here, find a snare drum. And actually, I quite like this couple of rims shot. You know, I like a rim shot sound. Sounds pretty good. Uh, it will also help me demonstrate something I've just realized. So what we can do here, we can choose this pad and I can load that one. So we've now made our first basic uh, drum kit. We have our sequence, our first track and our first drum program, which is the sounds for our drum track, of course. And we've labeled them clearly so that when we're looking around, and we want to know what is linked together, then we'll be able to see that. So these are the samples. Be able to play those. This is a problem because I like that rim shot sound, but as the title suggests, it was a couple of rims. It is, it's two rim shot sounds. I want to be able to edit that. And I've realized that that will give me a good opportunity to talk about one of the other confusing points of the MPC, which is sample edit versus program edit. You'll have to bear with me on this one just so that we can kind of demonstrate this. But I realized it was a big Google, uh, Google search for people looking how to, you know, understand the MPC. A big confusion point is sample edit versus program edit. So let's look at that. It sounds quite self-explanatory, but in reality, it's not. So I'll tell you why. We've created a program which is using the samples that are in the sample pool. It's dragged all of those in. Just because I didn't assign it to a pad, or I have assigned it to a pad even, if we go back to browse, you'll notice in sample assign, all of the samples are still in here and I could take them out and move them around like we did before. So we're bringing in these samples. And when we take a look at something, so if we select this sample here, and we go to sample edit, it chooses whichever was the last sample you pressed. But if you need to switch through, you can do it at the top here using this uh, data wheel. Or, you know, you can double tap and open it, but I can look at any samples currently loaded into that sample pool. So it doesn't matter if they're assigned or not. I can see them in here. And if we look for a couple of rims, that is the sample that we want to edit. We don't want the extra, uh, you know, rim shot sound here. We're in the trim page by default when we open up the sample page. So whenever you want to trim something, do your basic processing. I can do all of that. There's a processing menu. I want to truncate, I want to extract, normalize, fade in. You can see there's a whole bunch of different options in there. We're not going to go that far in the dive. But know that when you're trimming, these are the things that you can do. Now, we loaded in that sample. It sits in the sample uh, pool. And I consider that like the master sample. And I'll explain that as I go along now. We have all these pads here. That's another thing quickly just to touch upon. These are playback modes for trim. So uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you've got a basic one here that plays the sample. You want to listen to it. This one, for example, loops the sample. 
and the red ones generally stop and you've got lots of options. I'm not going to go through all of those, but just understand that they are playback modes that do different things to help you just sift through and trim and process your audio. So we've got our sample pool, like King Master sample, if that's what you want to call it. And it sounds like it sounds here. We've got the two uh, rim shots. What we really want to do is we just want one, so we could just edit it like that. And again, multiple ways to do multiple things. You can use your finger here, or I could select the right Q link, it'll highlight in orange, and then I could use my finger here. So that's the start point, move over to the end point, and I can move my end point that way. I prefer using these because I'm just more of a tactile person. Also, these move in stages. So the first one moves in big chunks, this one a little less, this one a little less, and this one a little less. So you can really fine tune your samples. But for quickness, we'll just use the finger there like this. We've moved that over. So now the sample is this, which is what we expect. We can now go out of here. Now, I can just jump over to program edit, but I just want to make sure it's clear what we're doing here. So I'm just going to go back to main for a second. We created a drum program called drum samples. And when I go to program edit, that is what we are currently editing. So we open program edit. You'll notice it because it says it at the top there that this is the drum samples. So we are editing inside of here. Now, if you go back to sample edit, this is the sample cropped. If I just go back to main and we're playing our drum samples, you would expect that our sample is now edited, but it isn't. It has its own independence at this point, because when you create a drum program, you're essentially making like a copy of that like master sample. That's why I call it like the master sample is because we have this kind of main version and we've just kind of created a copy here. So when we're looking at program edit, we can still hear that sample just as it was originally. When you're inside of here and we want to look at the samples individually, I can look at a sample here on this level. And we've got a bunch of tabs here. We don't need to get bogged down with those, but we want to make sure we're looking at the sample itself. We can see exactly the same sample as we can see in sample edit. However, the end point has been moved here and this one hasn't. So we have independent control of this copy, if you like, of the master sample. So that's fair enough. We could come in here and we can edit this sample in exactly the same way. So when we're on our main page, we fix that and we've done what we wanted to do. However, I want to show you the differences uh, you know, between these. So if we go back to program edit, let's put this one back. So it plays and it's got the, the tail on it. If I go back to sample edit and I make changes to the master sample here, and let's say we process this, we're going to make a permanent change. We're going to discard the information. So we're going to essentially truncate this sample down. I'm going to click do it. I've now got rid of that. Now, maybe you're ahead of me already, but the sample sounds like that now. And that is a permanent thing that we can't undo. If we want another copy of this, we would have to go back to browse and load in the original copy and then work from there again. But if we go back to main now, we're now playing our drum program where we do our drum program edit. That sample has changed. And if we look at program edit, it's also been changed in here because we've adjusted the master copy, which adjusts any um, obviously any kind of like slave versions of that, if you like any copies of it inside of your program edit. So if you adjust your master sample and you do some kind of processing on there that is permanent, uh, you will low, you'll, you know, you will no longer have that flexibility. So if you want to keep the flexibility, of course, in sample edit, we didn't need to truncate this down. We could have left it with that tail. Should we need to go back and take that tail part? But we've got rid of it. So it's got rid of it globally throughout this entire project. So I hope that makes sense. And we'll touch upon it again later when we do some sample chopping. But those are the key differences, which I think people struggle to understand. Uh, is why when you, you know, you tweak something in one menu, is it not tweaking it in another place and everything else? But it's because sample edit is for editing your master sample. When you create a drum program or a program of some kind, we're creating a copy of that sample essentially, which keeps its own independence until we make permanent changes. So we've now set this up. Got some nice drum samples so we can begin to build our sequence. We can record our first drum loop. 
couple of things. When we use our transport controls here to start recording, press play. You'll notice the playhead running along here. And what I like about the NPC is that you kind of see that wherever you go. It doesn't matter where I am here, looking at loops, I can be a different menu, not on this menu particularly, but everywhere else generally, even the sampler, I can see this playhead moving around. So there isn't a dedicated recording screen. If I wanted to start recording my pads now and doing that, I can do it while this sampler page is open or I can do it on the main page. You'll notice when I stop, it stops the playhead wherever it is and I press play, it picks it back up from wherever we left it. If I want to skip to the beginning, I use play start and you'll notice it just keeps starting from the beginning. So you can record from midway in your sequence or you can record, you know, at the beginning. Generally, for a lot of recording in, I'm going to be at the beginning to record and, you know, do it that way. So we're pretty much good to record. I want to talk a little bit about recording as we go through. We have a metronome option here, so we can set the volume, count in. I can enable it. It's currently off, so I'm going to need to enable that at least for recording purposes. I can have it with record and play. There's a whole bunch of options. We've got the rate, we've got a click sound. You can change the click sound if you don't like it. I'm just going to keep it for recording for now. And because we've moved the playhead along, I want to do record here. And I want to do play start because I wanted to skip back to the beginning. When we do that, it's going to count me down because we've set a count in of one, two, three, four. I can begin recording and then we can, you know, go from there. The first thing though, is do we want to apply any quantization? So we have this timing correction button. So quantization on the NPC is timing correct. It's the same thing. We can see we're at 1 16th notes, no swing or anything, just very standard stuff. I'm going to close that and I'm going to leave that set. If you want to turn it off and on quickly, you can do that with shift and TC. And we're going to leave it turned on. And there's a reason for that, which we'll talk about as we go through. But we are now ready to record our first 80 BPM two bar loop. So I'll just pat, you know, drum in something very basic. Um, and of course, this is quantizing. So I want to set this off. We're good to go because recording is pressed. I want to do play start. And we've recorded our first loop. Now, with a keen eye, what you'll have noticed there, hopefully, or if you didn't, it plays record for the first two bars because that's the duration of the sequence that we've set. Whatever your duration is, it's going to be in standard recording mode for the duration of that first length, whatever it is, in this case, two bars. When it comes around for its first loop, it switches to overdub mode. Now, overdub recording means that I can add more samples in. So I could have recorded that by just putting in my kick drums first, then maybe come in and do the snares and do things separately if I liked. Of course, I just played them all. But that's how it works. It records. Now, whenever we record something, we are recording MIDI information. All of these programs here refer to MIDI information. Doesn't matter what type that we're using. The only time that differs is when you're talking about audio tracks, which you can bring in like a DAW. So you can record instruments and, you know, vocals and all that kind of stuff. Everything here uses MIDI information and it is dependent on each track and each program. So for this track here, we have now got our drum program. That drum program has its own MIDI information. And if we look at the grid, we can see that MIDI information has been recorded, which is all of our drum samples here. It's tight to the grid, of course, because we've recorded it that way. So we've, you know, put a strong quantization on of 1 16th notes and it's done exactly that. It snapped them in there. I didn't have fixed velocity on, so I can see a little orange in here for changes in velocity. That would be different if I had set full level or even the shift for the half level, which is a nice touch on the MPC. But for each track, that's what we're doing. So if I record a new track for my sample chops with a new program, whether it's a key group plugin, it's going to create independent MIDI notes that are going to be in here. If you build your entire song inside of one drum program, so I've got loops in here as well as the drums and my bass and everything, you will see all of that MIDI information inside of this one particular grid. But if you separate it out, that's what you're going to get. So nice and simple. We've now created our first drum loop. 
I'm going to show you a couple of ways of recording drums in just so that you know how to use this device in a way that's going to suit you. And as much as I like doing this sometimes, I also like resampling as well. So I'm going to talk about that in a second. But first, let's take a look at the options inside of the grid view. We have a few here. So we have some basic tools. We can zoom in with the magnifying glass. We can use this selection tool. Oops, not knock my microphone so much. We can deselect or we can select a bunch of notes or a single note if that's what we're trying to work on. We can do all of that. We have the option to draw in notes, of course, and we can erase those. You can also use your undo button. So I draw in a couple of notes that I don't want. I could just undo those as well. All very basic, simple functions, easy to follow. We have a quick select for a row or, you know, a particular pad. So I can grab all of the kick drums. I can grab all of the hi-hats here, these hi-hats, these snares. And then we have a couple more options at the bottom for just kind of navigating around this if you want to do things manually. So I could nudge them. And with timing correct enabled here, you'll see my snare drums start to move. Let's just make sure we're looking at everything. But I can move my snare drums by a 16th note. It jumps to the next 16th note. If I turn timing correction off, when I move things, I move by tiny little increments. And I can undo that as well. The quicker way is I don't need to turn timing correction off. I can leave that on. I just wanted to show you that it's linked. I can actually just use uh, the don't snap function here. And if we just zoom in a little bit closer, maybe that'll be easier to see. But if I choose don't snap and then move, I get the same thing. Sometimes your screen moves a little bit, but you will notice you just need to get it to settle. And it's a little bit of a pain the way it jumps around sometimes. And there's probably settings in the preferences for that. But as I move things, I'm moving, you can see it here, just very small increments along. So it does the same thing as turning tiny correct off. So I'm going to undo that and just put it back where it was for now. But that is a quick way of, say, just grabbing the snare drums using uh, Don't Snap. And I can just shift those ever so slightly off the grid. You can also do it completely manually as well with your finger. You can select the notes and you can pull notes around if you've got the right selection tool enabled. I can shift and move things that way. And again, I want to undo that step. I can do it. I prefer working with the uh, rotaries. So we've covered that. You build a sequence with our first track. That track has all of our samples because it's using our drum program here. And that drum program is recording in this MIDI information to our track. So hopefully that makes sense. It's not as complicated as it first seems when you look at these things. But understanding this will just make, you know, making beats on this thing seem so much easier. So we've created drums in that way. What I'm actually going to do, I'm going to go back in here for a second. There's a various ways that you can delete information out of this, but I'll just quickly bring this down for a second. Select all of the notes. Do shift and do cut just so I can show you another function for that. So I now no longer have any information. I still have the samples, but there's nothing been recorded into this track now. We've deleted it, essentially. We can come back out. And that is because I want to show you how to resample. And I do that with drums quite often because sometimes I don't like working to the metronome. I just want to... Just play and not worry about the metronome. Just play and then create loops. You can do that nice and easily on this device. The first thing I want to show you is we can start getting into a little bit of mixing and looking at levels because some of these sound a little loud and I'm also getting some clipping here, which I can see. Now we have an ability to look at like a track mix so I can adjust my track here. I can adjust the volume of the track. Uh, if we go back to the main and we open up this little eye icon, I can show you how quickly from this same screen we can also edit. So. We have a track mix, so we can do the same thing by the track. We can do it by the program. We can do it by the pad. So you just want to adjust an individual pad. You can do it. And also you've got this like crown logo where you can look at like the master output. Also useful for inserting effects here. You can do it on this level. So currently we are looking at the drum program called drum samples, which is labeled clearly here. That's what we're changing the volume of. So as a basic starting point, if I wanted to just play these, I can see probably with like the kick drum and as the samples are building up, we're losing headroom. So everything's going to start clipping. I can select this and I can use this dial or use my finger. 
just want to bring the level down so I know it's acceptable and I can click on those if I want to reset like the peaking meters just make sure it's not doing it give ourselves a little bit of headroom I'm not too worried about the volume at this point but that's what we'll do might come back up a little bit got a little bit of headroom now while we're in here if I wanted to apply some effects on this level because this is levels of course we're now applying effects to a drum program itself I could do that I could do it again on a pad per pad basis and I can do it in here or I can also do it inside of program edit where we're adjusting our program so our drum samples program I could go in here and apply effects and I could put those on individual samples I could apply up to four effects lots of ways to do the same thing here I'm just going to do it overall because what's cool about resampling is that we can have our drum samples but we can apply effects to those before we resample them so I could go to inserts here and let's say I wanted to you know add some reverb to these drums I can click an effect slot and again I get four of those to apply to my entire drum samples group and let's say uh, I don't know we wanted to apply a little bit of reverb overall it's pretty strong but you can hear it there and of course again we're applying it to drum samples the whole thing being organized with your names lets you know where you're at we can use the pencil icon to open this up and change the parameters in here and again you just want to use your finger you can I like using the Q links so I make sure the correct Q link is selected with this orange rectangle here and I want to change the mix I want to probably make the room size a little bigger make the time a little longer there's lots of other parameters we could choose of course but for now we'll just keep it really basic take the mix all the way down so it's just a little bit of reverb maybe even a little less still sounds good so let's say that was what we wanted to do I can go back whoops if we go back into insert effects I can add another one because we've got up to four let's say I wanted to grungy it up a little bit put a filter on or something like that I could do that in this case maybe let's just do something as simple as that we'll apply a filter overall currently it's not doing much but if we open it up we can play with the frequency cutoff and of course I can change the type whether it's low pass high pass again inside of program edit you have all of this to do on individual pads or you can do it as insert effects you can do it in multiple different ways whatever you're most comfortable with but here we're just going to apply a filter to our drum samples program overall and I just want to run some high end off so same cue link just to run a little high end out make them a little more lo-fi I can do that then we can come out of here let's say we go back to our main we are now ready I need to check here because I'm seeing some clipping and of course sometimes when you add an effect it might make everything really loud so let's just again check on a drum program level yeah just checking that we're not getting any clipping there we can skip over to the sampler because we're going to do some resampling and what I love again we have the playhead here so if you want to do some resampling to a metronome you can do that because we can turn the metronome on and it won't be recorded internally you're not going to hear that metronome sound but if I wanted to make my drum loop say it was exactly 90 BPM I could set 90 BPM here press play have my metronome going and then resample to that you know uh, particular tempo I'm not going to bother I'm just going to freestyle it and see what happens on the sample page we have a max length for how much you want to sample for I want to sample I've got this set for two minutes I'm not going to use anywhere near that but you can set this and I believe by default it's some tiny little amount of like 10 seconds or something daft uh, so set your length for your maximum length that you want to record for we need to set the inputs at the top here to be resampling so we can resample from the right channel the left in this case we're going to do left and right and when I press arm to record it waits for me which I really like so it's going to wait before I begin recording and that way I just need to work out the tail end of the loop and crop that down and we should be good to go so 
we'll play something here and I'm deliberately just going to play any old mess for a second so that you can see this recording. I'm going to stop that recording and then we get the option of where we want to save this to. Do we want to send it to a program? Do we just want to keep it? I'm going to do discard because it's a take that I don't want. I just wanted to show you the options there that you can do a take. If you don't like it, just get rid of it. So let's do something else. Again, I'm not going to be concerned about BPM. We'll work that out in a second. Good enough. We'll stop that. You'll notice as I looped around, I played the next kick drum of, say, the third bar. It was like a two bar loop so that I've got an easy slice point to come back to and chop it out, which we'll do. So I'm going to say keep, but I need to keep this somewhere. And for now, I'm just going to add it to our drum samples program. I'm going to choose a pad here and you'll notice it changes depending on the pad you're choosing. And I can do keep and we'll do it like that. So now that sample is here. And you'll hear that last little tail kick. So when we go into sample edit, again, if I leave the master sample alone here, I could loop this up. The loop is going to be roughly about there. Well, you'll notice if we go back to program edit again, and we're looking at the drum samples program, if I play this. You'll hear that tail and we can even see it here is unaffected because we're not messing with the master sample. So again, it's your choice at this point whether you want to do something destructive or you want to keep that and give yourself the option to play around and have some independence. Because this is just a loop and I want to crop it to a loop, I'm actually going to change, uh, change the master sample. So I'm just going to loop it quickly there. We can use this pad at the top when we're in trim mode to loop it. Just wanted to make sure the loop sounded about right, which it does. We can then process this, use discard, which is truncate. And now when we zoom out, we have a proper loop. And again, when I go back to program edit, because this is a global change of the master sample, the one that we have in our sample pool, we have cropped that down as well globally. So we've lost that independence, but we didn't need it. We just wanted to make that loop. So inside of our drum program now, this will loop or it will certainly play at least just one playthrough without the extra tail, all completely as we wanted. So hopefully that is helping explain between sample edit and program edit and how you have like a master copy that you can, you know, tweak. So we've now made a loop. That's another way of making drums. We still need to put that into our sequence. So how do we do that? Well, in exactly the same way as we did before. We've now created something with its own BPM, and I'm not sure exactly what that BPM was because we didn't set a metronome or anything. If I go back to the sample and put this into loop, I can quickly find it or get close by using tap tempo so we can loop this through. Stop that. Every time you click four taps of this, it's going to begin to start calculating a new BPM, which is changed inside of our sequence. So it's actually telling us we're roughly 86 BPM there. If you want to tidy that up, you can use shift when you have BPM selected to get fine increments and then just move this here. We're going to just rotate that till we get 86 dead on. And I'll record it in 86 and see if we have any great problems. But hopefully it's close enough to an 86 BPM loop that it will work out for us. So if we go back here, I'm just going to hide this menu. We don't need that for now. We deleted all the old MIDI information. So these individual drum samples are now gone. We're good to start recording into here again. I want to make sure timing correction is definitely on because this is going to be just one loop that is playing throughout this sequence. And I want it to snap exactly to the beginning of the grid to make sure that it works. So we're going to have timing correction on. And all I need to do again is press our record button here and play start. And it's going to set us back countdown. We're going to press our new loop. Let that play for two bars because we know it's a two bar loop and hopefully it will line up and everything will work as we need. If not, we'll have to fix that. 
So let's press play start. going to let that play through that's the only tricky part when you've put a loop in is that it's going to loop obviously even when you stop your sequence there for a second but we'll live with that you can see the new bit of midi information it's one note because it's just playing this one sample for the whole length of the two bars all nice and simple the one thing i want to talk about quickly is the record and overdub so i mentioned before overdub would allow me to come back in and play these samples if we just went back now and decided to record over this and I use the record button instead of overdub, just watch what happens to my sample here. So let's say we were going to start this again. I hit record. I do play start because I want it back at the beginning. And let's say I just wanted to play a couple of these other samples in here. Just watch what happens to our MIDI note. It erases that note because we went back to record and not overdub. Whenever you're coming back in and you want to add samples into something, uh, you need to, you know, whatever the sample is, whether you're playing something melodic, you're going to need to be in overdub mode. Now we can just click undo and undo that and our loop is back. But that is the difference between record and overdub. So whenever you're coming back to something to add more samples in, same MIDI information, you need to make sure that you have overdub enabled, not record. So if I was doing it again, I would do overdub record and then play start and I could add other things in there. But for now, we don't want that. Um, so we can just click stop. We don't need to do that. We've now created our drum loop. I just wanted to show you a couple of different ways. In this case, of course, we resampled a drum loop using some built-in effects. And I think resampling is really fun. It's a quick and bold and immediate way of working. So I do that a lot, whether it's on this, the SP404, the MPC Koala sampler, any videos you might have seen me working, I do a lot of resampling just for quick speed. Saves you getting hung up on individual levels too much and worrying too much. You can just resample and get moving. We now need to create a new track because we want to add something else to this. So we're still working with the same sequence. The only thing that has changed, of course, is we've edited our BPM because we made a new drum loop, which was a different BPM, and we switched that out. I'm going to hit this track here. And what I'm going to do is just rotate this dial once to the right so that I can create a new track. You can double click and do it that way. So we now have a new track. What is our intention for that particular track? I'm going to name this as Chops because I think we'll chop up a sample. Why not? We'll do that. I can click do it. I now need a new program that is going to be associated with my Chops. But the way that it works when you're doing sample chopping is I could just browse my sample, load it into the sample pool and chop it from there. But I just want to show you I can drop it onto another pad here as well. And the reason I don't just create a new drum program to bring a sample in and then chop it from there is because it just saves a step because whenever I chop my samples, I usually assign those to a new drum program anyway. So for now, I just need a little space, a little house to put my sample before I slice it up. So we're just going to browse for the sample next. Let's go to browse here. And again, just quickly with the sample pool, everything we've made, including that new drum loop, which can be named, of course, if you want to be organized, which I should be doing really, is if I go to my sample edit here, I can save that as whatever that is. So we said it was an 86, I think, BPM loop. Uh, so let's just call it 86 BPM um, loop. So we've renamed that sample. Just again, when I'm searching through my track mix, what am I looking for? It's going to be more interesting on a pad mix basis. But if I look at my pad mix, I'll be able to see 86 BPM loop. So when I'm adjusting volumes, I can tell exactly what I'm looking for. What are we going to do now? We need to bring some samples in here. So yeah, we're going to browse. We're going to browse for a loop of some kind or a sample to chop up. I'm going to go back to my SD card, come up a couple of levels here, and I'll use a Beat Butcher one because why the hell not? Um, let's see what we've got here. We've got Music Chops. Let's just pick one. I'm trying to move down because sometimes when I do these videos that are just demonstrations, I just end up using the same things a lot and I want to switch it up a little bit. that one. 
that's a nice sanding sample. We'll be able to use that. So I'm going to choose a destination pad. I'm going to click load. And I've now loaded that sample into our original drum program samples. But because we're not using any of its MIDI information, we're not using these drums either that we originally had, it doesn't matter. As long as I don't play that in with the original drum program, you're not going to hear that at any point. It's just literally sitting there as a way to just access the sample quickly. So I can go into sample edit and you'll notice I didn't select that pad. So we're still on the 86 BPM loop, but we can look for that sample, which will be in here somewhere. Uh, where are we? What was it called? Oh, it was this one. So we've now got our sample here. We're in trimming mode again. We want to process, do anything. We can do that, but we're just going to dive straight in and begin to chop this up. So we can move from trim here over to chop. You've got thresholds, regions, BPM, all the usual stuff that you want to you know, slice this automatically. I'm going to do it manually. And by doing that, I just press the pad to kick off the sample. And then I can just pop my chops in wherever I need to do it. I'm going to do shift and zero snapping because that will mean when you're putting in the points, it's going to try and get it as close to a zero snapping point as it can to avoid clicks and pops. And it's pretty good. It doesn't always work, but it's a pretty good start. So we can begin. Now, when you're in trim mode here, if you wanted to tune your sample before you start, I've got a global tuning here, so I could do that. I could, you know, I could tune that before we begin. Uh, keep that in mind. Sometimes you might want to just audition that and get your pitch somewhere before you like it, uh, before you chop it even. And I can still do that later on, and I'm going to show you how we can still play with the pitch later on. But if you just want to pitch it first, you can do that. You can play around with the uh, trim mode. We're going to chop, so let's start it off. And I'm just looking for any little points there. And I kind of missed one there. I can use the little delete tool if I want to go back. And you'll notice every time I press the pad, it kicks off from the same point. So if I need to get back to a space, I can just keep doing that. Let's say they were the you know chops that we wanted. We've created seven. As you could see, I could delete those quite quickly on there. You can do shift and you can clear all from here if you need to just get rid of them. There's a whole bunch of other options, but we're just going to keep it with the basics for now. So we've created seven slices, seven chops. And I can now just quickly tidy those up. I can still tidy them up once I've assigned them to a new group if I prefer, but I like to do it here just before I begin so that everything's good to go. I'll use the magnifying glass. And I can just zoom in, take a look. I notice it's a little bit behind where I want it to be here. And when I press each pad, plays the slice that I'm working on. Again, I can use my finger to shift these along, but I like using the Q links. So I'm going to make sure the Q link is set there. I'm just going to click undo because I didn't want to mess too much with it. I thought when I pressed the threshold, I might have changed the uh, mode for a second. I want to make sure that start here is selected with the Q link. So we just come along. Start is now enabled. I can now just shift this along. With these Q link knobs, the top here again is big movement, little bit of movement, little still, and then finer increments again. So you really want to dial in, you can do that. And I usually just use the second one to just make sure there's no clicks and pops and it's in the right place. <laughs> Okay, good enough. So we've set our start point. I don't worry about the end points normally until I've started overlapping and I work out what my beat's going to be. Uh, and again, we're just going to keep it really basic for today. So we've created those slices. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to turn those into a new program, a new drum program. And I'm going to do shift here and convert. And that's going to give us the option to do that. Now you can see new drum program using slices. There's a whole gang of other options of things that you can do, but we're going to keep it basic. 
And instead of non-destructive slice, I actually kind of like having pad parameters because I want to be able to tweak the pads with a little bit of independence there. So pad parameters, the one that I go to, I'm going to click do it. You'll notice nothing happens here, but when we go to the main, we have our original drum samples, drum program. And if I scroll to the right, we'll see a new one with the name of the sample that we chopped up. Now, again, to be organized, so we know what we're looking at, I'm actually going to rename it to, um, I don't know, let's call it chops and then samples. Oops. Because, of course, that's what we're dealing with, and it coincides with the chops track here. So we're just being organized. Now, if you notice, when I scroll back, my drums is associated with my drum samples and my chops with my chop samples. It just keeps me organized. I know where everything is and it's easy to follow. So we've now assigned those to new pads. They're all playable. We don't have a ton of chops there, but it'll be enough for us to mess around with. We can now play along our track and we can get our chops to fit. When we do program edit, because we're now using a different drum program here, we're now editing this one. And you'll get that because it says chop samples here. So again, we want some independence. We want to play around with things. We can apply envelopes, filters, effects, all kinds of stuff inside of here. On a basic level, on global, if I switch this Q-Link over so we're controlling here at the end, again, I could just use my finger, but I like using this rotary here at the top to change the pitch of all of the samples together. And what I like about it is that it doesn't ask me to put it into a choke group or mess around or anything like that. It's already set up my slices like that. They are set, so they are... I can only play one at a time. Don't need to worry about doing any of that. And I can just pitch them to whatever I want and it pitches all of them. So let's say I wanted to go down by three semitones just for speed. I can do that. Because we did pad parameters, I can still go into the sample here. And let's say I was doing something where I just wanted to create like a really weird, wonky, awkward effect. Whatever it is you want to do. I have independence now. If you do um, non-destructive slices, you can't change the pad, like, um, for example, like this semitone here, fine tune it. You can't do that independently. When I tune one of them, so if I tuned, I don't know, if we tune this one here and we tune it down a bit, you'll notice these are independent. But when you choose the, um, yeah, if you choose the non-destructive slices, it will change all of your pads at the same time. So that's another difference when you're working with the program edit because of the master sample, if that makes sense. Um, but when I want complete control, let's say I want to pitch this one down and this one up a bit, I can do that, which is why I choose pad parameters. I'm going to just set that back uh, and we're going to keep the overall global uh, pitch of around minus three semitones. So we've done that. Now it's just a case of seeing if we can make that loosely fit. And I don't want to spend too long on this because it's already going to be a long video. But let's see if we can just, yeah, play in a couple of uh, loose chops to go along here. What I'll probably do first is go back into the eye icon and just maybe give myself a little bit of headroom in here once we've got our drums playing. Of course, we can tweak it. But for now, I just want to do that. So let's play and just see if we can try and work something out. And I think because of the pace of this, um, I think well, we have to wait for that loop, unfortunately, to finish playing. Uh, I think, yeah, I think maybe I'll just try pitching them a little bit more. And we can do that, of course, while it's playing. I'm going to do this on a global level. So we're going to go back to global. Let's say that was what we wanted. Uh, we can record that now as a basic loop. And again, I can do that by just pressing record. I don't need to change my screen. If I want to see the MIDI information that's being recorded, I can go back and I can use the grid view. 
but I can just record this at any point whenever I'm working on most of these menus. So let's record that in. The playhead has moved, so we need to do play start. So we're going to do record because it's a new recording. Play start. Real basic stuff, but it gives you an idea of how we can do that. And again, to touch on what's happening here, our chops track has this MIDI information, which is the chops. We go back, we move along back to our drum samples. It has a different bit of MIDI information, which is just the one note that we recorded earlier. So whenever you're recording these, unless you have all of your samples in the same um, program, you're going to notice independent like MIDI information. Keeping it, uh, keeping it separate like that, I think is also important because it is easier to adjust that MIDI information. If I built everything inside of one uh, drum program and I've got all of my drum sounds and then all of my chops and then my bass line and everything in here, which you can do, it just becomes a real pain to dive in and be scrolling and trying to find all of that, uh, especially when you want to make edits. So I like keeping everything independent. So we've now created two tracks. We've got our chops, our samples, we've got our drums. Let's add another layer to that. Let's add a new track. So we're just repeating the process. We can, uh, of course, just turn that, create a new track. Now, I don't want to make the video too much longer because we're already at an hour here. So we'll add a couple more things. Let's maybe add like an effect layer, just like something with a couple of effects that we can use. Keep it really simple for today. Um, so what kind of program do we use? I'm going to use another drum program. So I'm going to create one. And now we have our track three here. We've got our chops track three. We need to label this. So we're going to call this, let's just call it an effects. And down here, our new drum program, where we're going to put new samples, we're going to call effects samples. It's going to be, again, easy to follow and easy to understand. So we can browse again and just try and find a few things. Um, if I go back up a few, let's go back to MPC SD and come up. And if I go to, I don't know, let's try a couple of like textures or something to add in here. I've got this Beat Butcher one that is messages from outer space. It's really cool. Bunch of weird noises. And again, we can audition and try our, you know, track with this. That sounds kind of cool. It's kind of definitely loud. Let's turn that down a little bit. Um, but that's the one we want. So we've got a new program. We can put this sample wherever we want. I'm going to load it onto this first pad here. Uh, click load. Still pretty loud. Let's uh, adjust the volume for a start. Let's bring it down so it's not killing my ears. Suddenly goes up quite a lot there as it gets a little bit later on. And bear in mind as I'm doing that, I'm actually adjusting the level of this entire program. So in a second, if I bring a few more things in, I need to adjust that. It will be better to have adjusted the volume on a pad level, but I just wanted to get that level down because it's, yeah, it's crazy loud. Let's go back to browse and see what else we can find. So we've got like a weird space sample that we can use that I think will fit well. Um, let's see if there's some kind of vocal sound or something that I think would work well with it. Uh, let's go up. I've got a bunch of like weird vocals and stuff in here. Take something from a movie. Yes. Uh you don't make up for your sins. You knew the second I saw you. The mark. That's the way it is. What the mark of the devil? I don't know. I've used this one before in something else, but just for this example, let's use this one. Ideally, when I'm working and doing stuff like this, I kind of I've gotten away from using a lot of sample pack stuff. I try and just get my uh, Spotify or whatever it is I want to record from my turntable. Try and get that set up, and then just be recording and sampling in. I really enjoy the process of actually sampling and cropping audio, um, but for demonstrations like this, we'll just pick whatever we've got. So let's say that's the other sample we want. We're going to load that onto a pad. The mark of the devil. 
And you can hear I've brought that volume down, so I might need to adjust those as we go along. I think we'll change those independently in a second. Um, yeah, I think for that particular layer, that's what we'll do. So the video doesn't end up too long. We'll keep it there. So let's go back and adjust that. When I was here before on the main, I was adjusting my main output. So I can put that back. I'm going to bring it down a little bit because overall, I don't want that much volume. But if we go to shift and pad mix here, I can then adjust these independently. So I'm going to bring the volume of this outer space thing. We'll bring that right down. Let's just play it and see what it sounds like. Good enough. Um, and then with this guy now. The mark of the devil. The mark of the devil. Good enough. On a pad basis, we can add our individual effects, as I mentioned before, and I can do it here using this little menu that we've had open before that uses the eye icon. But if I wanted to, I could also do this in program edit and just apply effects inside here. So we have our samples that we can see the mark of the devil. And let's say I want to apply some effects to that one. I just make sure that's selected. I go to the effects page here and then I can choose effects to apply there. And with this one, something as simple as a delay would do. We can use this air diff delay. The mark of the devil. Sounds pretty cool. I'm not even going to worry about messing with the, uh, you know, the presets or the parameters for that particular effect. But if I wanted to, I'd use the edit icon there and I could do that. The mark of the devil. I think that sounds pretty good just as it is. If we wanted to add any more effects, of course, we can stack those up and we can do that there. Hopefully. <laughs> I have a noisy cat and he's decided that it's uh, dinner time, which is another reason I'm not going to make this video too much longer. But you can hear him uh, meowing there. He's a Bengal, so he's pretty noisy. Um, yeah, we've now got this here. This other sample has a long tail. It doesn't need any more delays or echoes. So what we want to do is we want to record those in. We're going to go back to main. We're set up. Good to record. The playhead again has moved, so I want to do record here because it's a new recording and I'm going to do play start and I'm just going to put those in. Now, one other thing, actually, before we go any further, let's say this was the seed of an idea, because, of course, all we're making here is a two bar loop. But a two bar loop broken down can become, you know, a bit of a breakdown. I could change the chops. I can change other things by duplicating my sequence and then creating variants of that. Uh, so there's plenty of scope here once you've just got a seed of an idea. And that's how I generally work. I take this seed of an idea and then I stretch that out into multiple different sections and add you know, lots of different layers. It's only because I'm talking that it takes me, what have we been, an hour and eight minutes so far just to get this basic thing done. But hopefully it's been useful to you guys. Um, but yeah, so we can build from there. Let's say I wanted to put these two samples in, but even just in two bars, that's a little bit crowded. I can go to the bar length here and I can add, you know, let's say make it four bars. But what happens if you adjust it here, which is what you might expect, is it plays the first two bars and then there will be silence because that other, you know, two bars has not been filled with any audio. However, if we drop it back to two bars and go to the edit here, we can actually just double the length of this uh, particular sequence. I could also halve the length if I wanted to. I've got the option to start bouncing down if I wanted to bounce it to an audio file and, you know, essentially kind of almost resampling again, I can do that. But for now, we're just going to double the length and then go back. And what it has done now is now four bars like we want, but it has duplicated the first two bars and, you know, given us four. So now when we record this in, we're working with four bars and it'll just give me a little bit of space to put these samples in. So let's do uh, we're going to do record, play start. So that 
you know, is the basic format for creating a sketch in this case. But that could be the, you know, the seed of a song. Let's talk about a couple of other things before I sign off, because I've got you so far. I just want to get you the basics so that you can, you know, you can really start making your own tracks here. Hopefully I've made this clear as to how each of these sections work. And again, if we look at our tracks now, we only have three tracks at the moment, but we have one drums with drum samples. Two is the chops with the chop samples and three is this effects with the effects samples. So by keeping yourself organized, you will always be able to work out what you're working on. Um, and again, when it comes to things like track mixing, I just want to mix all of my tracks now and get the levels right. I can see exactly which one of these I'm playing with. And, you know, it changes in the title here. It's all nice and clear. Same on a pad level. If we're working with our drum samples and we shift and we go into pad mix here, um, this one is actually using the effects samples, but we can change that. You can scroll down and check out, say, the drums. I can see all of my individual drum sounds. I can see my chop levels in between if I needed to adjust those. And with the effects, I can see this devil sample and everything else. So being organized will make your life so much easier with these devices. We've done the basics. We've created a loop. Let's say what I wanted to do now was expand upon this loop and turn it into a bit of a track. I'm not going to go through the whole process, but I want to give you a few more things that you can use here. So we have this loop four bars, 86 BPM. Now, a loop like that, if we just dropped out the drums, could be the intro to the track. So what we can do here, we can go in and we can take a look. We have the ability to copy a sequence, so I can copy this sequence and it's going to ask me what I want to do with it. I want to create a new or new sequence and I can give it a new name. So in this case, let's just call it loop two for a second uh, and we'll do that and we'll click do it. Go back to the main. I have now created an exact duplicate of that original sequence with all of the samples and stuff intact. So on loop two here, if we went to our drums track, for example, uh, and I can clear stuff out of here. So if I just wanted to clear it and clear off everything, I can do it that way. Again, just so that you're aware of the independent MIDI information, we can do it in here and just delete anything out that we don't want. So I can use the eraser and hopefully, <laughs> sometimes you really need to zoom in here. We can erase that sample. So this particular loop now has no drums to it. Uh, and if I go back to the main here, you can see, uh, you know, we've made some changes or maybe not see, but you'll be able to hear that in a second. So I've created two loops. And again, going back to the idea of being organized, I'm not going to go any further than that because you get the idea of what I'm talking about here. But that could now be, uh, say, the intro. So we could call this intro. I know that one doesn't have any drums in it. I could delete and I can do other things. But for now, let's just keep it this way. Nice and simple. I go back to my first loop that I could then call my, I don't know, let's just say this was going to be the first verse. Let's say I was going to have an artist come in and rap over this or something. That's going to be the first verse. So we're working in this main view. Now we can switch to take a look at another view. And this time I'll use the screen just for the sake of it. But we can look at a couple of things. We've got this next sequence, and I'm not going to dive too far into this because this is a video on its own. But we now have our verse and our intro, and they are playable here. Still requires us to press play and start. So we have our intro. If I select the intro with the pads here, and I say play start. <laughs> One thing that I forgot to do there, if we go back to main and we go back to this, we're already on our intro here. We're still on the drums track. What I forgot was that I extended that up to four bars. So really the drums actually kick in again. If we uh, scroll along here somewhere, should be able to see them. We need to get to the third bar and then move to wherever they are. So I should have deleted that the first time. Of course, with our intro, if we go back to main here, Let's say I only wanted the intro to play for two bars. I could have just shrunk that back down again. And I can do that by just setting this down to two bars because we're just going to crop off some information and that keeps some of the information there. Or I can do the edit and I could come to half the length 
and do the exact opposite of what we did before. Um, but I forgot about that. I forgot we'd extended it to four bars. But if we wanted the intro to be only two bars, that's what we could do. If we go back in here again and we go to next sequence. Now, when we play our intro, it's going to have no drums. And you will notice I can set that off from the beginning. I can play the intro and then I can just press this pad whenever I want. Of course, it's going to be kind of locked to the time. It's pretty handy and you can change those settings. You've got sudden if you'd like to switch pattern immediately. But if I just press this one, I'll do it for as an example. It will wait and then it will play into our verse. So we can have our intro play with, uh, you know, no drums at all. We could go into our first verse and then we can play from there. So let's do that. The mark of the devil. The mark of the devil. And you can see there, I went back to the intro again. So that is how you build the basic structure for a song. You can set your sequence in here. And again, I'm not going to dive into it for now, but understand once we've created these building blocks of a track, I can chain them together. I can send those to a song. There's lots of things that we can do, but that's essentially how you would build a track. The last thing, if you wanted to just quickly go in and do some mastering, you need to go back to the little eye icon here. Now I've left very little headroom. The sounds are all over the place. We need to level everything anyway. But if I wanted to, and I wanted to apply some master effects, I would remember here, I have my little master king output channel. I could go in there and I could, you know, I could apply some effects to that. So I could put some compression on here, a limiter, and then begin to master from there. And ultimately, as long winded as that is, because I've obviously tried to break it down into very simple instructions, that is how you build a song in a nice, easy and hopefully understandable way. So I'm going to sign off there. It's been long enough. And uh, yeah, I hope it's been useful. I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Take care.